I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I was born into, the church I loved with all my heart and taught my children to believe in, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I knew Joseph Smith was a prophet. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. I didn't start out challenging my belief in the church. Believe me, this new look at things has been gut-wrenching. I know there are those of you out there watching who are in as much turmoil as I was, but I hope that God will lead you to the truth Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Well, I guess this applies, this question will apply to even other thinkers, but uh, why do you think people even like a Glenn Beck, who with all of his smarts, ability to investigate and see the truth about DNA and archeology span and coins and swords and chariots that aren't here uh, and, the, and the book of Abraham, why do you think people that are smart um, still hold on to this testimony? Well, there seems to be this overarching desire for no bad news in the system, that the appeal of Mormonism, that no one's going to hell, no one will truly be lost. My, it's a good culture. We it's do a, good a lot culture. of good works, I yes. guess. Yeah. And so, in a sense, they've already sort of marginalized the Bible in their lives as just uh, a good guide, but they don't get too fanatic about it being really the Word of God. And so, if you have sort of a casual approach to the Bible, yeah. then you can make room for a casual approach to Joseph Smith's scriptures as well mm. and say, well, God's working some way. How can some people that talk about motherhood and apple pie be all bad? And uh, they're such fine neighbors. And uh, there's a new little book out, as someone was showing me, by a man that supposedly was a Protestant minister that became a Mormon and they sell it at Costco and yeah. I don't remember okay. what the name of it is but I read through that and it is so simplistic if he was ever a minister he never understood the Bible <laughs> he gives no doctrinal discussion everything is based on we had these wonderful Mormon neighbors I worked with these wonderful Mormon people culture it's and all social. culture yeah. uh, that that this wins him over yeah. and I'm thinking oh my goodness uh, what about doctrine? <laughs> Think a little there, please. Um, well, we're, I guess, kind of getting to the end here. Uh, what's your biggest aha moment? Have you had a big aha moment? And maybe we've even mentioned it uh, briefly, um, but one thing that just kind of, oh boy. Well, I guess the, I think the Book of Abraham issue was the most clear-cut problem area of Mormonism, although I wasn't aware of it. When I left Mormonism, it was on no. the basis of the changes in the Doctrine of Covenants, the changes in doctrine in Mormonism, the introduction of priesthood. These were all things that first vision. These were things that bothered me. Brigham yeah. Young's crazy teachings. <laughs> uh, but in today's world, I would say uh, and uh, something that stands out to be a problem for a majority of people I talk to is once they see the book of Abraham, that Joseph bought real Egyptian papyri, he claimed to translate them, and the documents 
no way support what he did. They obviously didn't know what he was doing. And when you see the BYU men today talking about it as some sort of inspired communication while he look, looked at the papyri, and it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to translate like the papyri, God just uses this as a vehicle to give him a revelation. I'm thinking, why did he pay $2,000 when the church is going broke and they spend $2,400 to get these papyri? And he writes in his journals, well, translating the book of Abraham today. Yes. You know, I mean, that's yes. what he wrote in the, in the history. Uh, any big disappointments you have? Well, my big disappointment yeah. is, is the church hasn't folded. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that men that claim to speak for God do not have the ability to stand up and tell the truth, that they continue to fabricate excuses for Joseph Smith, for his conduct. Uh, where is the church dealing factually with the problem of Joseph Smith marrying married women? Most Mormons do don't you, know that today. No, how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. another one. Right, yeah. and he's lying to his wife about polygamy. Uh, and I've had Mormons, when I've talked to them about this, they'll say, well, if they had to keep it secret, they would have been persecuted if they told people about polygamy. I said, yes, because it was against the law. It was against the law in Illinois to have an extra wife. It's just like bank robbers don't tell you they robbed the bank because they'll go to jail. <laughs> well, Joseph didn't tell people about polygamy because he'd been arrested. And then they even in, in was it section 101 that's been taken out? They yes. went out in the Doctrine and Covenants and said that we only believe in one man and one right. wife. 1835, canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants was a section that said they did not believe or practice polygamy. That was in every edition of the Doctrine and Covenants up until 1876, through the main polygamy period of the Mormons, they had a section in there denouncing polygamy. In fact, John Taylor, who was, what, the third president of the Mormon Church? Uh, before he became president, under Brigham Young, he had gone to England and France on a mission. And when he was in France, he was in a debate with a minister. And the minister had heard about polygamy. Yeah. This is in 1850, so they haven't publicly announced polygamy yet. <laughs> and uh, Taylor stands up as an apostle of Jesus Christ, holds up their current Doctrine and Covenants that still had that section saying they don't believe polygamy, holds that up and reads it to the audience. Oh, this is terrible. This minister is making up these lies about us. It says right here, we don't practice or believe in polygamy. John Taylor has 12 wives at home when he says this. He knows he's lying. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that was a real shock to me when I found that one out. So uh, w the church <sighs> needs to come clean on the, these things, but they realize to come clean on these areas, they would lose many, many members because for some, truth does matter, and mm -hmm. it would impact them if they found out uh, there were all these kind of problems. Wow. Well, one of the uh, goals of this show, of course, is to show former Latter-day Saints who mm -hmm. have whatever it is that's transitioned them out yeah. of Mormonism, but also their walk with Christ. Right. And so let's just spend a few yeah. minutes about what, what you have found in your walk with, with Christ. Because one of the things that we, uh, as LDS, we, we think we have a relationship yeah. with Christ, but, but what? Right. You, you tell us. <laughs> well, before I came to faith in Christ uh, in a Christian sense, as a Mormon, I would have told you I was a Christian, sure. but I would have said I wasn't Protestant or Catholic and that I was in the true church and you guys were kind of short on your knowledge of uh, all the true facts and all. In Mormonism, though, your focus is more on the Father. Mm. Everything's about Heavenly Father. Yeah. They don't talk really much about Jesus. In fact, after I left the church and I was working for Sears uh, and I was in this display thing in the hallway where people walked by me to take credit applications. And so one of the ladies I'd worked with uh, in a mutual roadshow thing came by. Oh, Sandra, I heard you left the church. Well, you know, what was the problem? Does someone hurt your feelings? I said, no, no one hurt my feelings. Well, why? why? And I says, well, for one thing, they just don't really talk about Jesus. <laughs> and she says, well, how can you say that? We end every talk in the name of Jesus Christ. And I says, 
Yes, <laughs> but that's all I heard about Jesus. You, you don't really talk about Christ. There's no praising, no... Uh, no understanding yeah. of that. And so in going to Christian churches, it was hard at first because I didn't understand the terminology. Yeah. But as I spent more time in the Bible, spent more time in Christian company, more and more I started to get a deeper understanding of what it meant for God to offer me salvation by grace. And that's something Mormons just don't get. They don't understand that free gift, do that they? That gift, because yeah. the Mormon takes it as saying it's a freedom to sin. Yeah. And I point out to them, that's like saying, well, once you get married, now you're free to sin against your wife. <laughs> well, not if you're really love, in love with her. That's true. And so if you really come to a love relationship with God, you're not trying to find ways to cheat on him. No. Uh, or short circuit him on his praise or what's due him. Because you love him, you want yes. to do your best. Right, yeah. right. And so that was a growing process to come to really appreciate uh, the wonder of grace mm. as opposed to the Mormon idea of wedding grace with works. So a Mormon looking at my life today would see a moral life similar to a life a moral Mormon would live. And yes. they'd say, so what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the difference is knowing that I am a sinner, that I disappoint God daily. But the wonder is that he still loves me and he's offered me forgiveness. Yeah. And uh, so that's why you have in First John where it talks about uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But it also tells us if we come to him, we have forgiveness. So the joy as a Christian is, yeah, I, I mess up all the time, <laughs> but I have a Savior that never messes up. Yeah. And when I first left Mormonism, I got a Phillips translation of the Bible. Well, it's kind of a paraphrase. And I would advise anyone coming out of Mormonism to get a modern language Bible. Now, it doesn't mean that the King James is bad. It's just that as a Mormon, you have been trained to see those verses with a certain meaning attached to the King James wording. Oh, that's a good point. And so as you read it in a modern version, it forces you to stop and think about the verse. Am I still looking at this verse as a Mormon would look at it? Or am I seeing it for what it really says? Because they are totally different. It's, it's a very different understanding yeah. of yeah. the meanings. And so by reading a modern language one, it mm. really helped me focus on what is this chapter really saying? What are these verses really saying? Uh, am I still holding on to a Mormon misinterpretation of this chapter? Yeah. It, it helped me a lot in working through that. So it's one of the advices I give to people is you got to get a modern language now, maybe later you'll want to go back to King James. I'm yeah. not saying not to use King James, right. but I'm saying to it help helps so you not, rethink it. Yeah, so you're not stumbling over those phrases that you've been so oh, familiar yeah. with. Oh, it was so long before I could read In My Father's House or Many Mansions oh. to not read Mormonism into that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or there are kingdoms celestial or, or there are bodies celestial. I dealt celestial. with that one. I got Pretty rid fast. of that one, but I still was hung up on this In My Father's House or Many Mansions. And well, it just means in my father's home, there's a lot of rooms, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, there, in other words, all he's saying is there's room for you. Yeah. Wait, I got a place for you. Don't worry about it. My place is big enough. I can, I got a place for all of you. Isn't that amazing? I actually made a list of probably 20 different things, the sticks of Judah and Joseph mm -hmm. and, and all these different baptism for the dead and all right. these scriptures that we use so often right. in Mormonism and, and actually have tried to evaluate them in context and what others have said about them. And, and, None right. of them hold up for Mormonism. Right. They're all explained away some other way, logically. One of the other things I find with people uh, that I discovered was in Mormonism, we didn't really, we weren't encouraged to do Bible study and we didn't study chapters. You know, it, you, yeah. you did, like in seminary and institute, you did proof texting and found, jumped around, found the verses you wanted. But in Christianity, we look at the, uh, the whole book, we look at the chapters, we look at the overall theme, and as we go through those, we start to then see, oh, wow, that's what God's talking about. 
that's, that's just great. <laughs> uh, in our Sunday school class where I go to church, right now we're going through 2 Corinthians. Oh, and wow. uh, we went through 1 Corinthians first, now we're doing yeah. 2 Corinthians. And, and even after all these years, you, when you get into a, to a serious Bible study, you start to see, oh, wow, I, I, there's a point I never really got before, or that's more precious than I realized it was. Yeah. And you see a, a greater depth all the time of what God's done for you, what he's offering you, it's, what he calls you to. It's amazing. Yes. There's a blindness that we've, mm. co we've talked about on the show many times and probably yeah. here during our interview with you, but a, a blindness that doesn't allow a Mormon to see beyond. Right. And I don't know um, what, what you'd suggest to, to Latter-day Saints. Uh, read the New Testament. You've got to get back and read that New Testament in a modern version, and it just doesn't say Mormonism. And why would they be afraid to do that? Because of what we've said before about culture and stuff? Is that why they'd right. be afraid? Well, they're told all the time the Bible's not reliable. You need to read the Book of Mormon. So all the emphasis today is on having devotions with your family and reading the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Why? Because it keeps you out of the Bible where you might get a correction on the, what it's really talking about. You remember the quote, or the, you probably heard this, uh, Bruce R. McConkie down at BYU said something about not developing a relationship with Christ. Right, yeah, he gave a sermon on that that was wrong to single out a member of the Godhead for special veneration. I was like, wow, God, you know, <laughs> I mean, Thomas, uh, when Jesus appears to the apostles and Thomas falls down in front of him and he says, my Lord and my God, uh, why wouldn't we want it to? sounds like worship, doesn't yeah, it? It's yeah, it's worship. I was, I was shocked when I heard that. And I don't know how many people know about that, but right. uh, when we get the concept that Jesus isn't enough, yeah. that we have to do the work, it really yeah. does diminish him. Right. And, and what he was willing to do, right. I don't appreciate it. Another advantage, like on the uh, Bible aspect, uh, I had a friend that was coming out of Mormonism this years ago. She was troubled over priesthood. And she had seen the different proof texts versus the Mormons would pull out of the book of Hebrews to support Aaronic, Melchizedek priesthood yeah. and those things. And Christians were telling her, that's not what Hebrews is about. If you really understood the book, you'd see Jesus is the only high priest. Yeah. The Aaronic priesthood has been done away. She was so confused. She decided one day she was going to go up into the mountains, take her Bible, and she was going to spend the day reading and praying about the book of Hebrews until she, she just pleaded with God to show her, what does this book really mean? And by the time she finished that day out, she realized the book of Hebrews was not Mormonism, that it was not Mormon priesthood. This was all about Christ. He oh is our priest. He is our intermediary with the Father. It isn't a bunch of men. It's not like the Old Testament priests going into the temple. It's Christ who's entered into the Holy of Holies, spiritually speaking, on our behalf. And that's what was the final step for her in leaving Mormonism. Wow was reading and praying and pleading with God to give her understanding of the book of Hebrews. Wow. Well, I've thought Galatians and Ephesians were oh, so sure. full of yeah. stuff. Well, no, I'm, I'm not. But for me to start yeah. reading those was, yes. was just dramatic because I'd never read those scriptures. I went back to my missionary Bible yeah. and, and I noticed all the li uh, scriptures I'd underlined. Yeah. They were all right. the Mormon scriptures. I'd left those alone when yes. it talks about another angel coming and yeah. giving us another gospel or if it talked about grace and yeah. Christ died in vain. Right, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 yeah. uh, about grace and Mormons just pass over that. Yeah. They don't see those verses at all. <laughs> well, I did have a couple of other little miscellaneous things. One was Gerald's statement um, that was in your Changing World of Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And he said, the most important thing that I found, however, was not that the church was in error, but that I myself was in error. Right. I found that I was a sinner in need of a savior. And I guess he told us that in this interview uh, that his favorite hymn was, I Stand All Amazed. Right. I looked that up by Char Charles Gabriel, yeah. and I noticed that there were a couple of word changes. I don't know if you've ever done that no, before. No, I haven't looked at it. But it says in one place about Jesus paying uh, the debt in Mormonism, uh -huh. and in and the way he originally wrote it was to pay my debt. Oh wow! And that's just a subtle but significant difference. Yes. Where yes. you're, where Jesus paid my debt, yes. and I owe him yes. for that sacrifice. 
Right, anyway. and that, that's the crux of the problem in Mormonism. They generalize Christ's atonement and salvation without seeing individually their own bankruptcy before God. Yeah, there's no admission of sin, of, really. Of, of a fallen nature. Of a fallen nature. Yeah, of, my of mom a, used to say to me when I tried to talk to her, uh, she would say, well, I commit sin, but I'm not a sinner. <laughs> And I said, Mom, how can you be a, a commit sin and not be a sinner? She said, well, when you say that, I think you mean something more than I'm re willing to concede. I do some wrong things, but I'm not really I'm bad not really like you're sin. talking about, you know. <laughs> not really a sinner. <laughs> I was going to ask you, was Gerald working on anything that he ever, didn't ever get mm -hmm. finished? I know yes. he, he passed away in 2006. Six, but he had been struggling with Alzheimer's. Uh, so th some things that he was working on in the 90s never came never to fru finished. fruition uh, and so I have some files of half uh, research things that he had been doing so um, you know but that's all in God's hands it's in God's timing yeah. at the time I wondered you know God why would why Gerald uh, here's a man with this brilliant mind that has done so much to research Mormonism and help so many people come out of it why would he take Gerald and we don't know, yeah. uh, but God felt Gerald had completed his mission, so yeah. he left unfinished products. Evidently, God didn't feel those were necessary. <laughs> uh, God can work things out without him. God can work it out without me, you know. Uh, but through it all, we, even when Gerald was no longer able to work on his research or anything, uh, God worked on things between Gerald and I those last years of um, areas in our marriage where we had, uh, well, okay, who takes out the trash, you know? <laughs> I mean, there's just little things in, in marriage that through the years, you know, y'all have... Yeah, hmm, things. Things. Yeah. And, and through those last years with Gerald, they were some of the best years of our marriage. No. Uh, because the important things became important. Yeah. You didn't sweat the small stuff. And, and so it was a beautiful time of uh, our relationship growing and also our dependence on God. Yeah. Uh, going through Alzheimer's is not something I would like to see anybody go through. It was a very tough time. And has left very deep emotional scars on me that oh, if I talk sure. about it very yeah, much, well, I start crying. Yeah. But God was there. And yeah. so I can say after all the stuff on Mormonism that we went through some tough days with his illness, but yeah. God was there. It didn't, yeah, it didn't make trust. me say, oh, oh, God, how could you do this to a us? trust in God and, yes. and a joy that you had had. Yes. And what was neat is that you were able to do it together. Yes. All these years. Right. And again, Sandra, you, you're just such a, a pioneer. <laughs> and I know you probably don't want to hear any of this, uh, compliments, but you've done such a wonderful work in yeah. helping people over the years learn the truth, and I know you've influenced many, many people. I don't think anyone ever talks about yeah. this kind of stuff without yeah. mentioning Sandra Tanner. So yeah. any last minute thoughts to the LDS people? Well, just get out your New Testament and start reading it. Pray that God will show you what the New Testament really means, that you would have a heart for God's truth, that regardless of what any man has said to you, God, I want to know what you have to say to me. As I read the New Testament, show me what you have to say to me. And that he's brought the, given us the book without, yeah. uh, without air, or without uh, heaven and earth will pass away, Wait, but my word will right. not pass God's away. God's word is there. So thank you, Sam. Thank I appreciate you. it. Understand Grace.
honestly, I never knew what grace was. I, I don't remember hearing the word grace growing up. Grace was an unknown kind of vague thing out there that people threw around and the only thing I knew about grace was it was a blessing you said before a meal or someone's name. And I didn't really understand what, what it really meant. It never really applied to my life growing up. And the way I understand grace now is God came to do for me what I just couldn't do. Grace is the difference between being a slave to everything I can't do and freedom. It just It's just everything. Grace is everything. After I'm saved and I find out that it doesn't matter who I am, that God's grace saves me if I will just trust Him for everything. And to think that God took what I deserve. He took my punishment. And He gave me what I don't deserve. It's um, mind-boggling, but He does. And it, uh, it just speaks to His love, His great love. So I found out in my reading that we're saved by grace, not by works. And it's those three words, not by works, <laughs> that threw me up on the ceiling. You had to peel me off. I couldn't believe it wasn't by works. It's just an amazing concept when everything is performance-based and you're always failing. You're always living with shame. You're always w living with, with, I've got to do better. I've got to do better. Grace is the difference between being a miserable failure and being his daughter. When, when you're saved by grace, and grace is receiving what you don't deserve, and we know we don't deserve it, we know we're not worthy, but God does it anyway. I'll tell you people, it's the greatest love story ever told, and, and I, just, I just weep with gratitude. Every single day, I thank God for my freedom. I thank God for the truth. I thank God that I have been given the keys that unlock the prison doors. Grace is who Jesus is. He is grace. And grace is something that gets me through all those things that I think I can't get through. There is power in knowing the truth. Know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And if God sets you free, you are free indeed. And I am free because Christ has set me free. Undeserved undeserved favor, a free gift from God, something He just gives me without, that I didn't deserve or earn or anything, and He just gives me His grace.